subscribing and leaving comments.
you might have taken from the previous remarks that this this is mythology. Well, it's mythology to the anthropologist, but it's not mythology to the Indian. It's a part of their real world. Uh, they don't make the this, uh, doctor. Get all the names. Uh, names. Names slip out of my mind. No, no, but uh, there's a man in, in, uh, in Portland who uh, did a paper on the fact that to the to the Indians there is no real unreal division, which of course we set such store by. Plain stuff, right? Uh, I, I got a perfect answer to this thing of getting old and not being able to recall things when you want them. You just forget about it. <laughs> anyway, uh, it's from the Coast Salish Indians who live in uh, southwestern British Columbia and the northwest corner of Washington where we got this word Sasquatch that was being used at this meeting. And uh, it's not really their word. The man who popularized that, that version was spelled to what, what he considered the original form, S-A-S-K-A-H-A-V-A-S, Saskahavas, something like that. And that man was John W. Burns, who for about 30 years in the first half of the century lived with the Chehalis Indians on the reserve on the banks of the Harrison River, which is 60 miles due east of Vancouver, British Columbia. He was a teacher and an Indian agent, and he took the stories that his friends told him about these giant hairy wild men quite seriously, and wrote about them in local newspapers, and eventually wrote some major articles in Canadian and English publications. So I'm going to leave up here a few copies of one of these articles from Maclean's magazine, which was a now is a sort of an imitation time or newsweek, but then was very similar to the old Saturday Evening Post, for those of you who go back that far. And this article dates from 1929. Now, uh, other than Mr. Burns, uh, in July 1924, there was quite a lot of excitement around Portland, Oregon, when the newspapers carried stories of a group of prospectors encountering a band of apes in Mount St. Helens. And they said they'd shot at least one of these animals and that others had attacked their cabin with a barrage of rocks in the night. And the, the name of Ape Canyon, uh, high up on the side of the east side of the volcano, uh, commemorated this event right up until the time when the mountain blew up and blew the thing away. And at that time, the newspapers were quoting information from the Clallam Indians about a, a giant hairy tribe that they called something that I would pronounce Seattle. But other than that, Burns seems to have been the only person taking really a serious interest in the story. And there's certainly a question whether his efforts come in the field of cryptozoology, uh, because the information that he had pictured them as a tribe of giant humans. Uh, however, there's no doubt that as far as Sasquatch is concerned, he's the, the grand old man, the, the pioneer of research into it. <coughs> Now, up to this point, everything I've spoken about is just stories, and you, know, you can dismiss them as lies and legends. Uh, there were reports of footprints seen by the miners on Mount St. Helens, and oddly enough, they, they were typical huge ones, except they had four toes. And uh, Mr. Burns also told him, having seen at least one giant footprint, that there are no pictures or drawings even that I know of dating back to, to that era. Uh, the first instant that I'm aware of, which I consider brought this into the realm of zoology, although it's kind of a delayed action thing. Uh, in October 1941, at Ruby Creek, which is beside the Fraser River, about 70 miles east of Vancouver, uh, an Indian woman living in an isolated cabin on the riverbank told of a hairy giant frightening her away from her home. And many people later examined a trail of 16-inch human-like footprints which approached and left this place. And a deputy sheriff from Bellingham made a cast of a track. And that while that cast doesn't survive, a tracing of it does. So, interviewed in later years, the, some of these witnesses recall that the, the weight of this thing made the tracks crush potatoes in the ground. 
and uh, they all agreed that it appeared to have stepped over a four-foot railroad fence without even breaking stride. Now, interest in the Sasquatch died away after Mr. Burns retired and moved to San Francisco and quit writing. Uh, it was revived in 1956 when Rene DeHinden showed up in the Harrison area determined to go hunting for it. And in 1957, the village of Harrison Hot Springs stirred up worldwide publicity by proposing to hold a Sasquatch hunt as a part of British Columbia's centennial celebration. Have, people haven't come up with anything quite so innovative here, I know. <laughs> uh, anyway, the, the publicity that from this resulted in a number of new stories coming to light including one account by a man who told of observing an ape-like animal at close range on a mountain in East Central British Columbia only two years before. Now this man was an experienced wildlife observer and he described and provided a drawing of a, a female six feet tall and almost three feet wide which was completely covered with dark brown silver tipped hair walked upright like a man and ate leaves from a bush by stripping the branches with its teeth. Now, this and a number of other accounts that came to light at that time contradicted what was definitely a popular conception that the Sasquatch were a tribe of giant Indians. And these people instead described something that acted like an animal and looked pretty much like a huge ape that walked upright. And just a year later, in the summer of 1958, with a second surge of interest generated quite independently in the northwest corner of California, their huge footprints started to appear overnight in the dirt where a road had been constructed, 20 miles up the valley of a remote stream called Bluff Creek. And one of the road crew made a cast of a footprint and took it to a newspaper. And as a result, the word Bigfoot came into common use. And Bob Titmus, one of your honorary members, began at that time a lifelong hunt for whatever animal was making a footprint. Uh, what was particularly significant to, to me in the beginning about this Bigfoot thing was that a tracing that was made of this track in California was almost a perfect match for the outline of the cast made at Ruby Creek 17 years before and 800 miles away. And the California situation differed drastically from that of British Columbia in that the footprints continued to show up there. And uh, we didn't have any idea at that time how remarkable that was and didn't take advantage of it the way we would hope it would be done now. But in fact, uh, footprints still have been found in that area over the years, uh, as recently as uh, that I know of, as, as three years ago. So uh, whatever it is, is still in that vicinity. In the late 1950s and the early 60s, they were seen so frequently that uh, those of us who were involved were, became quite familiar with the tracks of at least three different individuals. Now, there have probably always been a few enthusiasts like that deputy from Bellingham who've been investigating Sasquatch reports without their activities coming to public attention. Uh, I know now of a footprint cast from Washington and also a footprint photo from California uh, that predate any of this real excitement about Bigfoot. Uh, but mainly any widespread activity in, in searching for these things dates from the casting of the track in 1958. And in particular, a major magazine article by Ivan Sanderson and several chapters in his book, of Abominable Snowman Legends Come to Life, stimulated a lot of people to, to get involved. And also the media attention to the subject brought out stories from a lot of new areas. Uh, mainly on the Pacific Slope uh, and all the way from Alaska to Southern California and a few others as well. Now, I'm not any sort of authority regarding the abominable snowman, uh, but of course I have been paying attention over the years to stories that come from there. 
But I note that from the Himalayas we, we get the same few stories over and over again. And I've also noted that there is no reference to tracks being found in any material except snow. And I don't know of a single plaster cast of a footprint. And in North America, by contrast, in just in the decade after the first Bigfoot excitement, there were literally hundreds of stories. Some of them were old, but a lot of them were current eyewitness reports. And there were also many hundreds of in fact, I would say thousands, because some trails had hundreds in them, of, of giant human-like footprints found. And casts were made, scores of casts, and not hundreds of casts. So while it's very easy for somebody who's just reading about this to get the impression that, well, there couldn't be any of that in North America, but of course over there in Asia, well, this sort of thing is possible. But actually, the, the vast bulk of the, the evidence is here in North America. And uh, that's the situation up until 1967, when Roger Patterson and Bob Gimlin came back from Block Creek in October with a 16 millimeter motion picture of a female creature, which exactly matched the witnesses' descriptions of this heavily built, hair covered by P. Uh, I'll just throw in here that the first time I saw a footprint, I got a real shock of adrenaline. You know, you're looking at this thing, and something made it. But when I first saw the movie, it was just, yeah, okay, that's, you know, you got a picture of one, but well, by this time I'd heard it described like that so often that it seemed quite familiar. Uh, however, the, the movie did stir up enormous interest in this subject, and that again brought out many old and new reports, with just the reports of entry numbering into the thousands, and stimulated a lot more people to get involved in investigating. Uh, many of these people took only a temporary interest, at least as far as being redacted. But others have stuck with it, and of course quite a few of you are here. However, I'm not supposed to talk all day, for, so from this point on, uh, I'm not going to name any names, and uh, I'm not going to try to keep following a, any kind of a chronological development. Uh, but the Patterson movie, although it was taken 20 years ago, does remain the most impressive piece of evidence that the Sasquatch is a real animal. And the site where it was taken is well known and was studied by people before time altered its appearance. And there is no grounds at all to doubt that this movie does show something walking in that location. So it's not a Sasquatch, it must be an imitation of one. Either a man or a machine. Well, there's no walking machine that sophisticated. So you can rule that out. So, Really, if you've seen what the movie industry has done with all the resources that it has in trying to do Sasquatch imitations, you can rule that one out too. However, if you rule out both of them, then you're admitting that, that the animal is real, so you have to leave an escape hat. And uh, I don't expect you know, the general public or the scientific community to take that attitude. And I'm not convinced myself that Hollywood couldn't reproduce an imitation of the Patterson movie, which of course is blurred and is underexposed as far as the animals are concerned. You know, if they put their technicians to do just exactly that. But what I am convinced of is that a couple of amateurs from over here in Yakima couldn't do it. There have been a few other motion pictures brought forward since then that are supposed to show Sasquatches, and there's quite a few still photographs. Personally, I don't take any of the other movies seriously, and so I'm not going to talk about them. Some of the still photos, they may be the real thing. The problem is they don't show enough to be convincing in themselves. They depend for their authenticity on the story that goes with them. And you know, those that could indeed show a Sasquatch could equally well show an imitation of a Sasquatch. There's, there's no way that you, you can know from the picture. Okay, well, and besides the movie, what, what has turned up in 30 years of search? And it's mainly footprints and eyewitness accounts, either of which could be fake and uh, in some cases have been proven to be deliberate, deliberate deception. But you, it doesn't make sense to disregard all of them just on that account. And uh, 
as evidence, they should be given the same weight in the scientific investigation that they would be given in any, any other form of investigation. And that's the subject which I'll be dealing with this afternoon. Now, uh, while stories can be made out of quick pitch fake, there are some aspects of this that, that you can't dismiss that easily. Our chairman, for instance, uh, has studied the dermal ridges of the little hills and valleys that the fingerprints are made out of on some footprint cast. And he has obtained opinions from experts in that field that these could not be artificially duplicated. However, this evidence has not so far been accepted as conclusive. It has also seemed quite apparent in a number of cases that the footprints show too much compression of the ground to have been made by human weight and strength. And yet they were in locations such that there seemed to be no way a mechanical power could have been applied. And the idea persists that there must be somewhere people competent to do tests that would establish absolutely whether such tracks could be faked in the ground or not. But so far, if there are such people, uh, these experts in the tracks have never been brought together. Footprints are not common, and most of them are encountered by accident. And it, it may be that Sasquatches generally avoid walking where their footprints will show. I think that's very probably the case. And still with enough patience, there, some people can find it. I mean, find them deliberately. As to eyewitness reports, perhaps the most impressive thing about them is that they can be found so readily and in so many places. Anyone who attracts public attention as an investigator of this phenomenon can count on being contacted by people who have stories to tell. A lot of these witnesses are in the category that the zoologists like to dismiss as not being, quote, qualified observers. But some of them aren't. For instance, the head naturalist at the National Park in the United States the Chief Inspector for our Provincial Humane Society in Canada. And in many cases, it can be argued that even if the witness is telling the truth, they didn't see anything that could have been staged as a hoax. But again, there are exceptions. The creature is described as performing actions that are beyond the physical capability of a human. And there are cases where the two conditions are combined. You have the fully qualified witness and the action with of which a human would be incapable. For example, not far south of here on Highway 95 in Idaho, in April 1980, Chief Inspector Donald Hepworth from the Ontario Humane Society says that he drove within 10 feet of two hair-covered bipeds that were crossing the road. And they weren't particularly large, just about human size, but one of them went up a six-foot high bank beside the road in a standing high jump. So try that in an eight suit. <laughs> uh, stories like that can only be dismissed on the ground of the witness is not telling the truth. Well, and of course, we have this popular notion, or at least it's popular among supposed experts that get interviewed on television programs, that human beings have some inborn need to imagine monsters. These experts never seem to be required to prove the existence of this need. Apparently, their academic degrees authorize them to assume it. Well, I have a question for them. How do they explain that in North America, at least, the human need to imagine monsters dries up in regions where the annual rainfall is less than 20 inches? And it's also assumed, again without any requirement to produce proof, that monster reports can be explained away by noting that a movie on the subject has recently been shown in the area in question. Well, it's true that publicity regarding an actual setting report in an area does often bring out additional reports. But I noticed that when the movie Harry and the Hendersons was shown, and I expect that it was seen by a far greater audience than any other movie on this subject, it didn't seem to stir up any reports at all. Okay, now besides track and setting reports, what, are the, what other evidence has been produced in 30 years? And there isn't a great deal, but some of what there is can't be lightly dismissed. Uh, there's a talk scheduled later today that I expect will contain information about rotten logs being found that are torn apart as if by a bear searching for grubs, but there are no clones. And also of holes that are dug in areas where there are a lot of 
fairly small rock, as if by a bear digging for rodents, but the holes are a somewhat different shape, and in some cases the rocks have been found neatly piled. And there have also been hairs and fecal material collected that didn't match anything to be expected in the area. And uh, this is the sort of evidence that I pretty well lost interest in years ago, because it seemed that the best it could lead to was a, a verdict that uh, it was unknown. And that doesn't really get you anywhere. But uh, today, with modern techniques for identifying proteins, there does seem to be promise that this verdict could be expanded from unknown to unknown higher primate, which of course would be exactly what we've been talking about and, and uh, should be of some value. And there is already one case in which hair collected in connection with other evidence of Sasquatch activity has been identified by radioimmunoassay as having proteins that are either human, chimpanzee, or gorilla. Well, it certainly wasn't human because much of the sample was wool hairs and humans don't have them. And the garden hairs all had tapered ends. And human hair grows continuously and the ends are cut off square. Now, the other two possibilities, it would have been easy to check with a comparison like this tool. But unfortunately, the man had ground up all the hair to try to get the maximum amount of protein out of it. So next time, I'm hoping that uh, some of it will be safe. Uh, now, each hair and species, again, that, that look interesting are not readily or frequently found, but it does happen. What has never been found is any bone or flesh from which an identification acceptable to both scientists could presumably be made. And the question why, if such creatures exist, no one has ever killed one or found a body is certainly a very valid question. There are a few stories of such things happening, but the physical remains have never been produced. And I don't have any answer to that challenge that you could expect to satisfy zoologists uh, or even the members of the general public. But uh, it occurred to me that really that shouldn't be a problem in this audience because all of you people are searching for things about which the same thing could be said. And unlike the uh, zoological predecessor, the gorilla, the Sasquatch does have suitable fossilized forebear. Uh, people who've taken a position on this mainly surmise that it's just Gigantopithecus, which doesn't happen to be extinct after all. And then there are a few that uh, argue for a Australopithecus robustus. Now, I've mentioned that for quite a few years there have been a lot of people looking for the Sasquatch. But I may have left the impression that this means that if the things existed, uh, one of them should certainly have been found. And I'd like to make clear that the odds are entirely otherwise. That no scientific or any other institution with the resources to go about this task effectively has ever been involved in more than a, a very marginal way. And not very many of the laymen who have been active have spent much time in doing anything that could actually settle the matter. You can't bring in a Sasquatch by compiling bibliographies or by writing newsletters or by interviewing witnesses or even by casting footprints. You can't even do it by finding a Sasquatch unless you are prepared to do something effective about it when you get the chance. Quite a few people who have looked for Sasquatches claim to have seen them. And all that does is to add to the list of eyewitness accounts, of which we already have a very large circle. Even taking a good movie of a Sasquatch is not likely to prove to be a significant contribution. After all, it's already been done. It used to be that a fair proportion of the people who were looking for these things were out there with guns. But public attitudes towards man's relationship with the animals have been changing very rapidly. And while there still are people who contend that shooting a Sasquatch is the logical way to establish that the species exists, and I'm one of them, I have the impression that there are actually nowadays very few man hours spent in the bush by anyone who is actually hunting. Uh, another change that has taken place is that the bulk of the reports no longer come from the traditional areas like British Columbia, 
Washington, Oregon, and Northern California. Information from these places has been scarce for more than a decade. But in the same period, there have been big clusters of reports from what seem to us very unlikely locations, like Florida, Maryland, Ohio, Michigan, Pennsylvania. And uh, it's easy to demonstrate that from California to Alaska, there's ample mountain forest to support a population of a large omnivorous animal. In the eastern part of the continent, this is much more questionable. But back in Ohio recently, I picked up a statistic that was very interesting. That apparently, Ohio licenses 300,000 deer hunters each season. So I would suggest there must be plenty of wild land, even in those, those parts of the nation that you know we generally consider to be densely populated with humans. Uh, I'm, of course, not able to do any amount of investigating in the east, and I can't say much about those reports, except that I have talked to witnesses in Florida and in Texas, in New Jersey, and in Ohio, who seem to be as down-to-earth and credible on the average as those I've interviewed out here. I'll stress on the average. Uh, the Eastern reports often involve odd-shaped footprints. And quite a few of them have what we would consider the wrong number of toes, generally three. And then they tell about creatures with eyes that shine red in the dark even when there's no light to reflect. And they have stories of a few that are supposed to change shape or vanish when you shoot at them. And there's also a very widespread tendency to link Sasquatch reports with UFO laws. And to suggest that Sasquatch are experimental animals brought to Earth in spaceships, or some even suggest that they are the pilots of the spaceship. Well, stories like that are not unknown out west either. And there are a good number of uncomplicated, straightforward kind of requests in the heat or reports from the east. But the proportions are different. The weird stuff is definitely overloaded in the east, and the, the uh, reports that sound like an animal are, are far the highest percentage in the west. And of course, it, it would be very convenient to just say, well, these reports that don't fit can be disregarded. But the problem when you're in the Sasquatch field is that's exactly what you object to when it's done to you. However, being a layman, I, I don't have any obligation to follow this subject beyond where my own interests stop. And I don't have any interest in looking for things that can vanish or things that ride off in flying saucers. And uh, I remain convinced that whatever else is out there or isn't out there, that the mountain forests of Western North America do support a population of ordinary earthbound animals. They're covered with hair, walk upright, and occasionally leave behind trails of enormous human-like footprints. And that's what I'm looking for. Uh, further than that, even though we do not have indisputable evidence that such animals exist, we might consider it indisputable, but it's certainly disputed, uh, I'll contend that once they are proven to exist, we will already know a lot about them. Because if it's a real animal, then it's only reasonable to assume that most of the people who claim to have seen one really did see one. And the odds are that most of the things that are consistently described will be correct. <coughs> and on that basis, from observed behavior, we know that these are not giant humans. And they're not even the semi-humans that so many people would like to make of them. They're a very animal sort of animal living very much the same life as a bear. And if you think that a, a higher primate with a big brain wouldn't do that, consider the gorilla, which lives very much the same life as a cow. Because you have a big brain doesn't mean that you have a lifestyle in which you have to use it. Sasquatches resemble humans in that they walk upright, and that so they don't have arms that are longer than their legs, and they have flat faces. And I would say that that's pretty much where the resemblance ends. They're a great deal larger than humans, and they're proportionately wider and deeper through, as well as being higher. So that an eight-foot Sasquatch would easily weigh more than a thousand pounds. 
They're covered all over with hair. They don't have long hair on their heads. Their necks are so short that they often appear to have no neck at all. They're solitary creatures, nearly always seen alone. They eat a great variety of things, including meat. They can apparently see in the dark because they're seen as often at night as in the daytime. And of course, the observer, the other end of what you have to have to have an observation, can't see well at night and isn't as likely to be around at night, which would indicate that the Sasquatch presumably are far more active at night than in the daytime. And unlike the other apes, they must be very good swimmers and they appear to make considerable use of water. So, keep in mind that anything as big as, as strong as they are would have a completely different relationship to other animals than something our size would have if we were wandering out there in the wood. And of course, the night vision and the, the hair coat also make very basic difference. I'm not aware of any indication that Sasquatches have homes. There's no evidence that they even use caves. Although I, I think you have to presume that they do have some sort of a den to sleep in in the winter because there are very few reports at that time and of course if they were active in the winter there should be tracks in the snow all over them. They don't have speech. They don't know the use of tools or of fire. And while they, when you reported throwing objects, I'm not aware of any report where they did an overhand accurate throw. It's always something just looping. And there is one man who claims very close observations who is sure that they do not have an opposable thumb. And I don't know of any reports that indicate clearly that they do have. Towards humans, they are not aggressive. They do sometimes show considerable curiosity to the extent of looking in windows or even shaking houses. Uh, there are a few reports of threatening behavior, but not carried through to an actual attack. They certainly are not necessarily going to run away, but there doesn't seem to be any reason to consider them to be, to be dangerous. And finally, they are certainly not an endangered species. To populate just the area of the Western reports would require very substantial numbers. And if the same species is responsible for the Eastern reports, and for those outside of North America, and this includes every continent but Antarctica, then uh, instead of the endangered species that so many people will try to tell you that this is, you're dealing with literally the most widespread wild creature in the world. Thank you. Why, what explains well, the fact that you know, it's, it's still 
mystery. Uh, why and why it has once been captured? Why it is uh, you know, why is it still? Okay? Well, I said that they were widespread, but I didn't say they were numerous in the way that deer, for instance, are numerous. They probably would be very few in a fairly large area. It's just that the area is itself so immense, there would have to be a great many of them in order to occupy it. Uh, and I've already said that as to why nobody brought one in, I don't have an explanation. That is extremely unlikely. Uh, what you're faced with, though, is a pair of impossibilities. It's impossible that there should be such an animal. It's also impossible that throughout human history, should, people should have been making the evidence of such an animal. And having studied it, I come to a conclusion which I think is shared by absolutely everybody else who has ever spent time on it. Uh, that by Occam's razor, the simpler explanation is that there is indeed such an animal. That you've got to devise an explanation for these footprints and reports throughout history and throughout the world. You're getting into something that is infinitely more complex and less believable. Great deal. I haven't had a high profile for quite a long time. There are other people who get more reports than I do. Some of them pass them on to me. I have had reports in the last six months. I didn't come prepared for them. Write many of them off, but they tend to blur. I, frankly, I'll, I'll, I'll state publicly that I've, had, I've dealt with so many of them that it's hard to remain interested but just another report. I can only say that uh, I've got over 2,000 card references, which leaves out a fair number that don't meet my particular criteria. Uh, about two-thirds to three-quarters of those are cited reports, so I just put them. I haven't counted them. But that's just me. I have no way of knowing how many there are in the world or whether there's somebody else who's got five times as many as I do. Certainly, if you could magically assemble them all, it would be well into the thousand. The uh, hair and fecal evidence, has there been any investigation of parasites? Uh, we had that done a long, long time ago when uh, Tom Slick was financing a group of us in California. And as I remember, they, Sanders wrote about this. Uh, it was something like uh, parasites were found in pigs and humans in China, and, and uh, I think pigs somewhere else. Uh, well, I mean, so what? We'll have time for questions uh, when John Green gives us another talk later. And also you can catch it privately. And we're only 15 minutes behind schedule, and much of the rest is mine, and I'm going to cut mine rather short. If you're enjoying all this rare and unique content, please show your support by subscribing and leaving comments.